Nom Nom delivers fresh food with whole ingredients, backed by veterinarian science. Science tells us that a dog's health starts in the bowl, so improving their diet is one of the best ways to help them live a long and happy life. Nom Nom's food is full of proteins your dog loves and the vitamins and nutrients they need to thrive. All you have to do is order, pour, and serve. Ready to make the switch to fresh? Order Nom Nom today. Go to https colon slash slash trinom.com forward slash curveball and get 50% off your first order plus free shipping. That's https colon slash slash t-r-y-n-o-m dot com forward slash curveball. Plus, Nom Nom comes with a money back guarantee. If your dog's tail isn't wagging within 30 days, Nom Nom will refund your first order. No fillers, no nonsense, just Nom Nom. Welcome to the Living the Dream podcast with Curveball. If you believe, you can achieve. achieve, achieve. Welcome to the Living the Dream with Curveball podcast, a show where I interview guests that teach, motivate, and inspire. Today, we're going to be talking mental health as I'm joined by author and speaker, Michelle E. Dickerson. Michelle focuses on recentering employees and transforming the mental health stigma in the workplace. CDC numbers show that one out of three people suffer from depression and anxiety, especially since the pandemic. Mental health has been such a big issue that even the United States, the United Nations has released a policy brief on the issue. So Michelle seeks to normalize the mental health conversation. So we're going to be talking to her about that as well as her book and anything else she's working on. Michelle, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Curtis. Thank you for inviting me. Why don't you start off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Sure, sure. I'd love to. And thanks for the introduction. So yes, uh, gosh, mental health has been the backdrop of my life uh, ever since I was a little girl. My mother was diagnosed with bipolar disorder when I was little and I cared for her. I was a child caregiver and cared for her throughout my childhood, adolescent, and young adult years. And that entire experience shaped my um, my understanding and my compassion for mental illness. And then um, I was going through a divorce and I got diagnosed with depression. So I sort of know what it feels like to be, to be a caregiver and also what it feels like to suffer. And while I was um, navigating my own depression, um, I was helping a the company, the former company I worked for, a uh, Fortune 50 company, build a mental health affinity group, employee resource group. So I got to see what things uh, were working that we were implementing to create a stigma-free culture. So uh, those are those are my lenses on mental health. And, and uh, I've been fortunate to give a TED Talk and write a memoir about my experiences with my mom because in my opinion, we need to be talking more. We need to be sharing stories so people uh, don't suffer in silence and they feel understood and comfortable uh, talking about their own challenges or their own struggles. Well, let's talk about caring for your mom. What was that like? And when you were actually doing this, did you know what bipolar and mental health meant? Did you understand what was going on or were you just doing what you needed to do at the time? Yeah, it was a combination of survival um, and just a a general understanding that she was not well. Uh, My mom had been hospitalized several times throughout my childhood. Uh, She had um, undergone shock therapy. Um, My grandmother would take care of me. Um, You know, so I I knew that she was uh, she always struggled with her health. I didn't really know a lot about her illness until I got older and started to ask more questions and get familiar with it. So, you know, 
for me, it was, we do what we need to, to keep peace in the family, to keep things quiet. We don't share with anyone outside the house. You know, stigma was really bad for me when I was growing up uh, in the eighties, mostly eighties. And so, you know, it was, it was my normal and I did what I needed to do, you know? Well, tell us how we can care for ourselves mentally as well as our loved ones, especially in these tough times that we're going through these days. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm so glad you asked because there are, there are things that we can be doing. And I, I have the privilege of um, helping organizations recenter their people. And in my resilience program, you know, one of the things I talk about is the importance of just getting present to how you're doing. You know, every day when we wake up in the morning, um, our body is talking to us. Our, our physical body is reminding us that, oh, you know, maybe we worked out too hard at the gym yesterday or something is still bothering us in our body. So it tells us, but we rarely do a self audit of how we're feeling emotionally and mentally. Um, and so that's the first step is really just getting present to how you're doing. And if you're not doing so well, reaching out to someone that you trust and talking to them. And that could be a family member, that could be a partner, it could be a friend. But in order for us to prevent ourselves from spiraling um, into an unwell space, it's really important for us to be present to how we're doing and to know what we can lean on to feel better. You know, even beyond a phone call, it could be, I need to go for a walk or I need to, I need to do something that I love and go and spend an hour doing that. So you know, that's really important is being present and aware of how you're doing. Well, statistics show that mental health illness is the most expensive illness in healthcare. Why is that? You know, mental health is, is, um, it's one of those things that, you know, I, I know from experience that, a lot of times we think we should be able to power through it and then we hit crisis. And then before you know it, you're out, you're out, you need, you need, you know, severe care, you're on disability. And there's so many things we could do proactively to help ourselves before we hit crisis. Um, it's expensive for so many reasons, you know, uh, healthcare, and then we're out of the office. If we're workers, we are, you know, having, there's disability costs, there's healthcare costs, there could be hospitalization costs. Um, so there's a lot of aspects to it. So, you know, my approach has always been, you know, what do we do daily, every day, day to day to preserve our well-being so we don't, so we don't um, become one of those statistics of, you know, having to navigate the healthcare system, number one, and then the expense of it. So, so yeah, I mean, I, if you talk to employers, even employers may not know the gravity of what they're paying because an employee that goes out on disability doesn't necessarily need to divulge why they're out on disability. It's sort of like a sick day. I, I'm going to stay home because I have a stomach ache when really they're, they're depressed. Um, so you don't really know. You, you can't really tease that out. But we know that the costs uh, are very high. Um, and this is something that, you know, if we do things to take care of ourselves, we could head it off and prevent a crisis and prevent um, needing those types of care. Well, speaking of investing in healthcare in the workplace, you say that for every dollar invested in mental health, it will yield a three to five dollar return. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because you're preserving well-being, you're keeping employees working, you're keeping them engaged in their jobs, you're keeping, um, you know, turnover at, at, at reduced, um, you know, uh, and, you know, in the workforce, when, when people go out on disability, chances are they, they may or may not um, come back. And then you have to deal with the turnover costs. So it just makes good sense to do more upfront and um, and prevent it than it does to um, have to navigate somebody trying to come back into the workplace after being out. We have a stigma, and it's really hard to come back to the workplace. And you know, people want to know, are you okay? Well, we, what did you go through? And there's, you know, there's a lot of shame, and guilt around that. So. 
So it really behooves organizations to do a little bit extra. And when I say a little bit extra, it's beyond benefits. It's beyond an employee assistance line. It's are your employees even comfortable picking up the phone and calling and getting support? Or is there so much stigma in your workplace and fear that they would rather try to tough it out? And we all know that that doesn't work. So um, that's why the work I do, I'm so passionate about because I consider myself a bridge because the first step you have to do is normalize the conversation about the brain. And when people feel okay about not being okay, then they'll utilize the services that the companies are already paying for. Speaking of the stigma on mental health, how does the, that affect those who are trying to get help since there is still a stigma even in these days? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very real thing. Um, stigma is... is uh, it, it comes from our, our childhood. It comes from our relationship to mental health. It comes from the media. I mean, it's, it's all over, uh, I, you know, it's reduced. I know it's better than it used to be. We have courageous athletes, Olympians, um, musicians coming out and talking about mental health and their own story, which normalizes the conversation, which is brilliant. Um, but we still have work to do in the space and, um, and there needs to just be more conversations about mental health and, and people who go first and tell their stories. Um, it really does help create a, a pathway for other people to not feel so um, uncomfortable acknowledging how they're doing. Tell us about the five steps to cultivating a culture of compassion that you created explain the steps and tell us what they are and why did you decide to create them? Sure. Well, there's, you know, from the time that I was in my corporate uh, role, I spent about 19 years in a corporate environment and I experienced a lot of things, but then I also witnessed what, what worked and what didn't work when we were trying to cultivate a culture of compassion. And, you know, there were distinct things that did work and things that were mistakes. So I, I remember it uh, quite well. <laughs> um, but the first thing is that leaders need to have policies um, that, that are in place. You know, you can create, um, you can try to create an environment that is compassionate, but if you're going to be a truly inclusive organization for people with invisible disabilities or mental health challenges, um, you really, you really need to have uh, policies that say we are inclusive of people of all abilities. Um, so that's like the first step. The other thing that organizations can do is they can create peer communities or employee resource groups. They're grassroots or like groups within the organization that bring their biggest asset together, and that's their people. Um, so we want to make sure that uh, people feel uh, connected. And, um, and the best way to do that is to have a peer community or to have an employee resource group. Accessible mental health care. It sounds so basic, right? But the last thing you want is to have barriers between your employee reaching out for help and actually getting help. So what does the organization do to remove barriers with accessing a clinician, for example? Are they able to pick up the phone and call your benefits you know, a doctor through your benefits and be able to get in, you know, tomorrow versus a month or two from now, if they need support and they pick up the phone, are there barriers? So remove those barriers. Education and training of people leaders, you know, people leaders are the face of the organization and how you feel about the company is how you feel about your direct leader. So if your leader doesn't know how to be compassionate to you or, you know, you don't have a trusting rapport with them. I mean, it's just not going to work because people leaders who lead a mental health challenge in an employee from a performance perspective, instead of an empathetic um, perspective around how they're really doing, it's a miss. It's a big miss. And then a culture that's ready for employee sharing. I mean, I gave my TED talk at my former company, and that was a platform that was established to tell stories and create and a relatedness between people within the company. And when I told my story in front of all of my peers, people came forward later on and said, I can relate to that story. You know, I have a loved one 
So there's real power in creating a storytelling platform. So yeah, those are the steps. Well, tell us about your memoir. Tell us what readers can expect when they read it and how can they pick it up? Yeah, thanks for asking. So my memoir was written based on the feedback I got from my TED Talk. It's, um, it's, a, it's a very vivid reflection of life growing up with my mom and what the experience was for me as a little girl, as an adolescent, and uh, as a young adult. It really was written to humanize mental health um, because I think that the, you know, places like the media don't um, really explain mental illness. So we fear it more than anything. So I really wanted to humanize what it was like. My mom, my mom was a sick person and I still loved her and I didn't let her disease define her. And it was hard because she was abusive. So I really wanted to take people on a journey with me to feel what that was like for me. But then also at the end of the book, I have an epilogue that shares, you know, all the wonderful ways that that experience has shaped me into the woman that I am today, how it taught me deep compassion and how it fueled my desire to do the work that I'm doing. Tell us about your youth program titled Perfect Just the Way You Are to quote a Bruno Mars song. <laughs> yeah. So I had, um, I had done a lot of self-discovery work. And in one of the programs I did, um, the instructor asked us that if we could make a difference in the world, what would it be? And I said to myself, you know, there were some deficits in my childhood. There were some missing pieces. Like my mom wasn't a typical mom who was supportive and reassuring and wasn't there, wasn't really the one to tell me you can do and have anything you want in your life. So I would envision there were other children that weren't getting that at home, the reassurance that they could do anything, that they were perfect, whole and complete just as they were. And I said, I'm going to create a program that really bolsters self-esteem and reminds kids that they're limitless because I'm sure there are some of them that weren't getting that at home, just like me. So I created that program and with the support of my former company, we delivered it to underserved communities in New Jersey and New York and Pennsylvania with the goal of just having them understand how to nourish their mind and how to nourish their body. So it had things like meditation, it had um, gratitude. It had teaching children empathy and compassion, what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes, you know, loving themselves for what they, what they uh, do or what they, who they are, not what they do, not what they wear, but who they are and, and, and really just having them be proud of who they are. So, yeah, so that program was really part of my healing, to be honest with you. And um, the program goes on today and is being delivered still within the company, um, with, supported by the company I used to work for in the community. So, yeah. You talk about in your bio how you feel that people's fear of mental illness is unreasonable. Tell us about that. Yeah, you know, um, it is unreasonable. It, it, you know, we have this thing in society where we either label ourselves mentally healthy or mentally sick. And the reality is, is when we relate to mental health as something that is either sick or well, then you miss the whole in between. And, and life is filled with ups and downs, right? So um, it's a continuum. Mental health is a continuum. And when we start to relate to mental health as a continuum and not you know, she's mentally well, and he's mentally sick. Um, you start to understand that, you know, we are going to have those experiences in life that take us down. I mean, I was adopted. I never in a million years thought I would get diagnosed with depression, but a life event came along, uh, when I was going through my divorce and it just knocked me down and, and it was really hard. Um, you know, and, and it was temporary. In my case, it was temporary. And I navigated it with the help of a clinician. Um, but it's unrealistic to think that we're not going to have those experiences in our lives. We are, you know, something is going to happen. And I mean, look at the pandemic and the magnitude of loss that we've all experienced in some way. So, you know, we shouldn't be afraid to acknowledge when we're not doing okay, we should just recognize it, get support and move on. 
and, and not make ourselves feel bad or wrong for having a hard time. When things occur dealing with mental illness, the media will pick it up and act like it's the worst thing that ever happened and that it's just one in a million. You know how, how they depict things. Can you yeah. touch on yeah. that subject? Yeah, you know, I think that they've become a little bit more responsible. I'm part of a couple of different mental health communities, and uh, those communities are demanding the media be more responsible with how they depict mental health, um, especially now with the prevalence of it because of the pandemic. So I'm hopeful things are slowly improving so that we don't hear, um, you know, we don't need false information uh, coming out when there are horrible incidents like school shootings, God forbid, or other random acts of violence. Um, so I, I'm hopeful and I've started to see an improvement in how the media is being a little bit more responsible. And, um, and I think it's up to us to educate ourselves and not rely on the media to educate us. You know, find reputable sources like the National Alliance on Mental Illness or Mental Health America if you're curious about what is depression or what is bipolar disorder and just educate yourself so that you know a little bit more and you're not relying so heavily on what the media is depicting. Can you tell us about any current or upcoming projects that you're working on? So excited, um, Curtis, because of the leaders program that I launched um, a little while ago. So throughout the pandemic, I was really honored to be able to support several different companies with my resilience program to help people, you know, working from home or who had had some type of loss in their life, like recenter them. And I loved doing that. But the feedback I kept getting from my from my clients was this is great, but if our people leaders don't know how to support their people, then we miss, we miss an opportunity to, um, to help. So they asked me for a people leader program. And so in that program, my whole goal with it is to give them more confidence and in, in having those conversations. There's so much trepidation around what can I say? What should I say? What's the wrong thing to say? I don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, but in reality, it's really about trust and listening and uh, connecting more than anything and treating your people like people before an employee number. So I'm excited about that leaders program because I think that that's going to make a huge difference for organizations because the people leaders are the face of the company. And if we can get them empowered and being able to look after um you know, their people and just be genuinely concerned. Um, I think it's, it's a win for everyone. Can you give out your contact information? You got any websites, social media links? How can people connect with you? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So um, for my, for my workshops, my professional workshops in the workplace, um, you can reach out to me on careforyourpeople.com. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. I have a mental health series called Michelle's Conversations That Matter. Um, and so follow me on Instagram at Michelle Dickinson 71. Uh, and you'll, you'll see there's an associate tab there and you can click on that and go to all 150 episodes of my mental health series, which really educates people on different types of diagnosis, um, resources that are available, Clinicians are, are educating us. Um, I had a woman on today talk, talking about what is bipolar disorder and any, any question was not uh, off limits. So I have that. And then um, if you're interested in my book, it's breaking into my life, uh, .com. You can find it on Amazon. I'm in the process of recording the audio book. So it's currently available on Kindle and hard copy through Amazon and barnesandnoble.com. Speaking of resources. Tell us about any, for the people out there who might need some resources that are listening to this, give us some mental health resources that you know, along with some final thoughts before we close it out. Sure, sure. So one of my favorite resources is called mantherapy.org. And it is a hysterical website designed to get the attention of men. And if you know anything about the statistics, men are less likely to get support 
right? In, in society, it says, you know, if, if you speak up about your mental illness, you're weak. So they've done a beautiful job at creating a platform that really speaks to men. So if you have a, a man in your life that you might be a little concerned about, this website is not only entertaining, it's educational. And it also speaks to those who love the men that they're worried about and has them uh, teach you what you can do to support them. So check, check that out for sure. Um, the National Alliance on Mental Illness absolutely is a great resource. If you want to know what the signs and symptoms of different types of mental illness are, you can go to their site and you can learn about those. What else can I tell you? Mental Health America is a tremendous resource and they have, uh, I think they have a COVID kit now of, of materials and information. Yeah, those, I would say those would be the three that I would highly recommend. So don't, I always say this because it's so important. Don't underestimate the power of asking people in your sphere, work and personal, how they're doing. You know, we make the assumption that the tough ones are okay. And the ones that seem to have it all together, have it all together. <laughs> but in reality, a lot of people um, suffer in silence and they, they're, they're just not going to be waving a flag. So don't underestimate the power of connection and just saying, Hey, you know, I haven't heard from you. Just want to check in with you. What's up? How are you doing? And check in on those that, you know, um, because you might be the only one checking on them. And then, um, it's okay to be okay. Not it's okay to not be okay. So if you don't feel quite well, reach out and talk to somebody, just keep talking, whether it's a friend, whether it's a, a minister or a, a family member, it is so important to get out of your head and verbalize what you're feeling. Um, the biggest mistake we make because it feels good is we, we go into cocoon mode and we hibernate. But in reality, all that does is it has us ruminate and things become much bigger in our heads. So it's the last thing we want to do, but I will tell you, try to connect with someone you trust. And that's going to be the first step to helping you. Ladies and gentlemen, careforyourpeople.com. Michelle Dickerson, I'd like to thank you so much for joining me today. You're so welcome, Curtis. Thanks for having me. And I would also like to let listeners know to follow, rate, review, share this to as many people as possible. This episode could save somebody's life or get them the help that they need. For more information on the Living the Dream podcast, visit www.djcurveball.com. Until next time, stay focused on living the dream.